And the ones you want to really pay most attention is basically kind of the, uh, the pre-tax and pre-interest uh, earning, the unleveraged. And you want to compare that with unleveraged capital that is needed in the business to get you a sense of what kind of business you're having, how much they're making. So let's just go through a couple of examples. Unfortunately, what, what, what I'm doing today, you know, I, I no longer talk about what we own. So I pick up a couple of examples of what I owned in the past. You know, I started this business in late 97. And, uh, you know, uh, along the way, been through a couple uh, <clears throat> really traumatic events. You know, one is sort of the Asian financial crisis and then the technology bubble, a couple of the different things. But during those period of time, you, you tend to have more interesting opportunities. Let's start with, uh, uh, let's go back to 98. So it was a fall in 98. And I tell you, the search that I go through are very simple. Because I'm interested in all sorts of different business. I usually just get a manuals. You know, I got hooked to value line while I was a student here. You know, every issue as it comes out, I just, you know, love to read the whole thing from beginning to end. Because that's really the best uh, kind of education if you want to have an encyclopedia knowledge base and database, which you have to. Uh, so just to go through that page after page after page is just enormously helpful. And, and the first thing I always check is sort of the new low list. You know, <laughs> The, the new kind of a low is the book, low is the P, low is this, low is that. That really attract me more than the new high list. Now this actually, I don't have any more of my copies. I get rid of that. So I asked them for reprint, and the number is not right. I mean, I was looking more of somewhere around, uh, uh, I think it's a September or something, August, that when the stock was roughly around 28. So this is a 46. It's not right. Uh, so it's roughly called that 28 to 30. Now you look at this one. You know what is the first thing jumps to you? Somebody give me a a quick read. Yes. I found that uh, the stock price fluctuation. Right. High and low change every year. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Oh, it looks like it's just falling off a cliff. Right. Right. Anything else? Now, if you're an in investor, you don't really care where it was traded before, actually. <laughs> All I care, and I tell you what I look for, is I first look at the valuation. And if the valuation doesn't fit, I don't even want to really kind of go beyond. So what's, what do we know about the valuation? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a good point. And what is the constitution of the book value? So everything, you know, every time you see is a below book value, you want to say, what's in the book? What's in the book? How much is the book? What? Now that's simple. You can just you know, call it a 28, and then you got a what? Uh, 11 and a half million shares, roughly 300 something. Low 300 million. Just do approximate. You don't have to really do all the quick ones. And you'll see where it is. Now, the, uh, uh, the uh, working capital is almost a 300 million, in a sense. And of course, it was the end of the uh, Q3. And in, in retail, what, what, what do you know about uh, kind of the end of a Q3 in retail? Is that this is really where you know, your, your kind of a quick uh, encyclopedia knowledge really helps you. All retails have built up a huge amount of inventory the last quarter. So you look at back to the previous years to say what is a normal like because they're going to really collect a lot of cash by the end of the year. So you say, okay, so it's a 300 million. It's almost the entire book value, roughly 275 million, is in the uh, is in the uh, working capital. Everything else cancels each other, and so you probably collect about 100 million cash at the end of the quarter if you look at the other two years. So roughly you got a 200 million liquid asset and plus 100 million of fixed asset. And if you do you know, a little bit more study, you're going to see there's entirely buildings and real estate, basically. So 300, and you're trading roughly 300 million. And so 200 million is a, is, is a liquid asset. And then about 100 million is, uh, is in real estate. So you've got a pretty decent protection on the downside. So what do we know about the earnings, the cash flows? 
And the ones you want to really pay most attention is basically kind of the, uh, the pre-tax and pre-interest uh, earning, the unleveraged. And you want to compare that with unleveraged capital that is needed in the business to get you a sense of what kind of business you're having, how much they're making. Give me a quick sense. How much is that? Well, if you're skilled, it shouldn't really take you more than one second to find that out. You got 13% roughly of, uh, of, of operating margins of 800, what, 800, 850 million. So you get roughly, what, 100 million, 110 million? And what is your deployed capital? How much capital is deployed in the business, roughly? You would have roughly about, say, 200 million in, in, uh, in liquid asset, and then about 100 million in buildings, and then the 200 million of liquid asset, probably 100 million is cash. So you roughly have a 200 million deployed capital, and roughly returns about 110 million dollars. So your return on your deployed capital roughly around 50 percent at that point. So that's not a bad business. So you shouldn't really, I mean, you start with, say, you, you give a five second look and you say, hey, the business, I don't care, you know, all the other things. The business was trading roughly, you know, read right around the book value. Book value is pretty clean. Uh, is basically consists of, of a tangible liquid asset, working capital, plus, uh, you know, 100 million in real estate. And, uh, and the deployed capital is basically two thirds of that, and and for that two hundred million, you return roughly a hundred million or so. And so it shouldn't be bad business to begin with. So next, you check sort of a, why this whole thing sort of fall apart at that point. Sort of a missing. I mean, whenever you say something like that, you say, "Wow, that's not a bad." You know, if I own the whole business, remember you always sort of think as yourself as a business owner. If I own this business, if I can buy the whole business at this price, you know, you, you probably want to own it. And it's actually it's not a bad uh, name, right? Most people recognize Timberland as a brand, right? So what is the reason at the time? Well, it turned out that was the height of the Asian financial crisis, that all their competitors, especially Nike and Reebok, see their sales, especially in Asia, uh, falling out of a cliff. And so the whole contingency, sort of all their perils, all the retailers, the shoes, and the international brand, anything that has exposure to Asia, all fall apart. But what else is, is going on? So, so you, try, you try to check you know, what other people are thinking about this. <clears throat> you, know, you, 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 you may not really listen to their advice, but you want to really know what other people are looking at. So you check to see whether there's any analyst report. It turned out there's no analyst report. Nobody covered this. Well, for a company is doing about a billion dollars in sales, is you know, it's a reasonable company, it's a big brand. So why nobody kind of a cover about this? Any possible reasons you can speculate? Yes. They don't have they have a balance sheet, maybe they don't go to capital markets, and so they don't need there's no mail list they're trying to sell products. Which is good or bad for you? Uh, for an investor it's good. Fabulous for you. Yeah. Fabulous for you. And you go back to, say, 10, 15 years. The good thing about value line is you go back to 10, 15 years, and you see whether they ever really need to that money. What did you find in the business over the last whatever years? It's been growing. <clears throat> the profitability has improved dramatically over the recent years, but has always been pretty profitable. And therefore, their need for financial market is very limited. Any other reasons? What's the ownership structure? Yes. Yes. What do you mean by family owned? They own 40% of it. How much vote they control? They have a 100% vote, basically, 98%, right? So immediately that turn off a whole bunch of people. And then you see what, you know, how the investor has been basically reacting to them in the past. You can do a quick. Uh, kind of a data uh, search, and this is really why you know I say that a uh, a, a investor should really 
investigative a journalist, because we have a journalist here. I'm sure if, if I ask a journalist, look at this question, you know, the, you know, the first thing you would say, would it go through all of those questions I just asked? And pretty easily you can find all the answers, and very quickly. And so you've got to have a very active, very curious mind. And you just can't, wouldn't really satisfy with any bogus answers. Otherwise, you can't really be in this business. So you go and you find there's actually a whole bunch of a different shareholder lawsuit. Now you have an owner who owns 40%, owns an almost 100% of the vote, and most of the shareholder doesn't have a vote, and you have no analysts cover them, and there are a whole bunch of a shareholder lawsuit. So immediately, that if you don't know anything about the business, if you are the 95% of the other investor, what conclusion you would draw? What would be your conclusion? If you were kind of you know a normal mutual fund or a hedge fund trading oriented uh, uh, investment manager, what would you say to this situation now that you find all this information? Please. Yep. So therefore, it doesn't work to own it. Right. To risk it. Anything else? Yes. I probably think I mean uh, the problem is temporary. Right. And uh, the stock is small case, not liquid. Right. So I may not put my money in. Right. Anything else? Yes. Yes. Anything else? You guys are not skeptical enough. Well, would you really worry about that uh, <clears throat> that management might be milking money from the company? Might be manipulating their books because they control everything. There is virtually no uh, there are virtually no constraints on what they do, and the fact there are a whole bunch of a lawsuit that tells you they complain about something, right? So what do you do next? What do you do next? Well, yes, that's one thing. Record. Anything else? What? Check the court records. Absolutely. You download every single piece of the document of the court cases, every single case, and read them from page one. And that's why I was saying that if you don't have a curious mind, if you just, if you just want to do it because you want to make money out of it, the chances are you're not going to do this. You have to really figure that. I just, you know, I'm just so curious. They said, what's happening in this? This doesn't add up. And you have to dig every single thing. And so you read everything, as I did. It, the first part, it takes a less than, you know, a couple minutes. You look at that one, you say, that's really what I want to do. I mean, all the questions you read leads you to all of that. So upon I can possibly find all the cases I can find. You know, all the cases really come down to really one thing. Actually, it's basically one complaint, it's just multiple filings. Um, that, you know, somebody really say, well, <clears throat> they used to provide some guidance, and they didn't deliver, and the investor get pissed off. And so the owner also get pissed off. You can, you know, vividly see his defense. You can get a sense of his personality by reading those documents. He said, you know what, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to talk to the street. I'm not going to give any guidance. I don't need a damn of a dollar from anybody else. The business is wonderful. OK, so that removes a big cloud. So the next thing, what do you do? Well, if they really run this, uh, run this way, the, the next question is, OK, maybe they're not crooks. But are they good managers? How do we know that? Are they decent people? How do we know about that? How do we go about to find that? What do you do? Sure. Anything else you can do? How do you know his personality? Yes. You try and uh, call his neighbors. Uh, <laughs> Good idea. Great. What do you call? What do you tell the neighbors? I tell them the truth. I'm an How, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm concerned. Well, one of the markets is concerned. Maybe the management may not be honest, and they'd like your opinion. <laughs> well, what if you just say, go to hell? You hung up? Well, I try and uh, 
M most people will tell you go to help. <laughs> <I'm busy. laughs> but it's a nice try. Anything else? Yeah. That's right. There was no Google back then, <laughs> but that's a good idea. Now you want to. The point is, you got to really go. You know, as, as, as again, again, you know, I just happen to have a journalist here, but I always view this job as investigative journalist. Most of people who have built businesses also have a big personality, have a history you can go to audit, have left a trail of evidence of what kind of person they are, and what they have done, how they deal with the different situations. It is not that difficult, but you have. To most professional managers wouldn't really consider that as a part of the business. But I'm telling you, you're the 5%. If you end up to be the 5%, maybe you're not. But if you try to be that 5%, that's what you do. You go to see their community. You go to the church or synagogues. And you, go, you, know, you go visit everybody. You, you sort of get yourself to be part of that. And you introduce yourself to all their friends and families and neighbors. Don't just call them. Go there. Spend a few weeks there. It's worth it. It's worth it. Just to spend as much time as you can possibly be to try to find him. Find what he has done to his community. What does neighbors and friends tell about, I mean, say about him? That tells you more about this personality. And you want to find the family dynamics. This fellow actually only graduated high school, never really went to have a college. Relatively simple guy, but a nice, decent guy. Has been very philanthropic. Go to synagogues, but not <coughs> terribly devoted. <coughs> but the more interesting thing, he has a son who actually went to business school as well. It was actually my age at the time. It was in the uh, <coughs> mid-30s, early to mid-30s. And at the time, already assumed to be a COO of the company. So I did all of the things I suggest to all of you. I did further, <coughs> and I find what this son's, all the board of the father and the son's on. And I find one of the board the son was on actually is run by a friend of mine. So I invite myself to be on the board. <laughs> so I join on the board along with the son, and we become very close friends. And then I really know what's going on in that family. It's turned out this is one of the most admiring family I've ever met. They are people of the highest integrity. They're wonderful. And they also happen to be brilliant businessmen. So after all of that, the stock actually is still trading right around 30s. And so that's sort of, you kind of answer it. You sort of know, you know, did I miss anything? You sort of say, probably not. I didn't miss anything. The other 95% just don't know. Or their industry imperative does not allow them to do anything about it. So what do you do at that point? What do you do? Buy. How much you want to buy? Let's suppose they have $100. What? <laughs> well, how, how much is that? 200. Okay. Well, I like to talk to this class because you guys are not polluted yet. Now, if you go to join a fund, the first thing people would tell you is, oh, gee, don't <clears throat> do anything more than 25 basis points. And then you go with maybe 50 basis points, you do 1%, that's 100 basis points. They use a basis point. So every number sounds big. You know, boy, we're going to do 50 basis points. That's a big deal. <laughs> that's what it's like. That's what it's like. So keep your innocence. Because right now what you're thinking is the common sense. Think about how much effort you put in to get this damn thing right. Think about how good it is. You have virtually no downside. You're trading roughly about five times. And the next thing I did is I actually went to all the different stores to see why in the last few years the margin improved substantially. It turned out there was a fad going on, in the, in the, uh, especially in the inner cities, that all the little kids want to have you know, the Timberland shoes and jeans. And boy, the things that you know, all the store managers tell you, they couldn't really get enough stock. 
And you look at how much of their international business, how much is actually in shoes and in Asia, less than 10. What they make out of that, less than 10. 10% out of the 10% of the 27%. So you calculate all of that, you say that all of them are gone, you're losing money. So what? It reduces your earnings by less than 5%. So I put a shitload of them. <laughs> Anybody know what happens afterwards? In the next two years, I mean, you guys all have the internet. You can check right away. They don't let us check forward, really? You should do that. <laughs> you should. Have. Why do you want to listen to all this shit? <laughs> you just do whatever you want to do. As I said, you know, you're right now because other people tell you to or agree with you. You're right because you need to do that. You need to check on that. All of those things should come to you in no less than five minutes. Otherwise, you're just not a good analyst. If you're not a good analyst, you'll never be a good investor. Seriously. So you have to at least technically train yourself to be very, very proficient with all of that. Well, the next two years, this damn thing went up seven times. And the truth of the matter is, during all those time, it was propelled by earnings. And so you, during all this time, you, did, you still did not have any risk. It's not like you're hiding, you know, writing some technology company after they double, tripled. You expose yourself to a huge amount of attack. It was never more than 15 times earnings, never. But if you trade it from five times to, you know, to 15 times, and the earnings have been growing in that period of time 30% a year, I mean, that add up. That add up. 